So I'll just introduce myself. My name is Nirmala. I'm an anthropology teacher here at Vanier. Uh, I'm the one who will be interviewing Rebecca Thomas, and I'm really excited about that. I want you all to know that this event is co-sponsored by the Indigenous uh, Major Studies. So if you can turn off your cell phones. Okay, that's a bad joke. Um, <laughs> We have muted you and we can't see you. So we've already turned your cell phones off for you, so to speak. But um, at any point, if you have a question uh, during the interview, uh, you can put your questions in. There's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So that's where if you have a question, you can put it in there. So uh, you can put a question in there anytime during the interview or also um, during the Q&A. So there will be about a 15 minutes where Rebecca will be able to answer all of your questions as well. Um, I'm not going to necessarily if you send a question, say, as we're chatting, that question will come up during the Q&A at the end in the last 15 minutes. Um, so, and the questions, just so you know, will only be seen by the panelists. So if you don't see the question, don't worry about it. It's just the panelists who are, who will be managing and, and sorting the questions for us. Uh, so before we officially start, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. It's very important. Um, we acknowledge that the place in which we work and study is situated with, within the traditional and ceded lands of Gahage, the Mohawk peoples, part of um, Haudenosaunee Confederacy. There is also a strong historic presence of Anishinaabe peoples in what is now known as the Greater Montreal Area. Uh, Jojage or Montreal has long been and continues to be a gathering place for many First Peoples from all directions. We honor and thank the traditional custodians of this land and strive to work for the success of future generations. All right, so let's uh, let's begin. You ready, Rebecca? Yeah, I was getting another poem up, so. <laughs> cool. Um, before, because I haven't really introduced you, so before we even dive into the questions, you mind just introducing yourself, maybe a bit of background about who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, Deloisi Rebecca, Deleoe Jiboktok Migawagi. Uh, my name is Rebecca and I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm Ilmu of the Mi'kmaq Nation and my family comes from Lenox Island First Nation in PEI. Um, I am, uh, a myriad of things, but it's kind of split mostly between kind of like writer and all of the things that come with that activism, community involvement, poet, that sort of thing. And then on the other side, I am a, an Indigenous supports advisor and student services advisor at the Nova Scotia Community College. So this is my plug to any students here. Make sure you go to your student services if you're having a rough go and don't wait too long because it makes it a lot more challenging for us to help you. <laughs> so that is the role I do on that side of things. So um, I help students when they're having a really hard go, um, essentially everything non-academic. So yeah, so those are kind of two roles that I do. Um, but in all in all, I think they're all helping roles because I really want to help and you know change the world for the better. Nice, cool. Yeah. Um, I know you just said that you're a writer and uh, I know that you're also, you do spoken word poetry. Mm -hmm. um, would that be a good way to, to start off this, this conversation? Sure. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I got a couple of things. I don't know what theme I'm going to do, I guess, for my poem. You know what? I'm going to, because we're, I wrote a poem uh, called The Other Mask You Wear, and it's COVID themed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open this up with a COVID theme poem because, you know, we're still in a pandemic. Yeah, we are. All right. It's called The Other Mask You Wear. Get up and wash your hands. Feel the anxiety set in. Grieve the moment right before you wake up when you thought everything was okay. Acknowledge with a sigh that it's going to be another monotonous day. Prepare for the mundane. It's all the same, but it's not. Put on your mask. No, not that one. The one you wear when you see other people. No, not that one. The one you wear to keep going through the motions. The one you wear for your daily digital devotions. Smile. Remember that nobody can see you smile. Smize. Smile with your eyes. Sanitize. Realize you no longer have to smile because no one can see underneath that mask. No, the other mask you wear. Head to the store. Fuck. You forgot your mask. No, the other one. The one you are currently wearing feels permanent. You wouldn't want your emotions to be seen as a detriment. Take a deep breath. Your mask is making it difficult to breathe. Yes, both of them. Your glasses are fogging up. You feel like you've had enough. You forget why you came out to shop. You feel like you can't breathe. Can't breathe. Reflect on the gravity of what those words actually mean. You can breathe. Take a deep breath. Tell yourself only one to 4% result in death. Actively deny those thoughts are ableist and ignore the nagging feelings of privilege. You've just always been lucky. Wash your hands. 
watch where you stand, go to Instagram, post a black square, double tap, post a link, share, place your phone in your back pocket right next to your wallet. You've done your part, no need to go that far. Forget where you parked your car, sanitize. Forget you're wearing your mask. Yes, both of them. Watch videos on YouTube. Commit to learning something new. Change the channel when they talk about indigenous death on the news. You've already done your part. Add another item to your Amazon cart. The nation has been shut down, this time by the crown. You comply when everyone is watching, but you still go to the bar even though you've been coughing because you remembered your mask. Yes, that one. At home, you cut out three letters and place them in your window. Feel your righteousness crescendo. Cry alone. It's been seven minutes since you've last checked your phone. Meet your friends through a screen. Internally scream. Only watch your digital reflection. Forget you've logged on for a human connection. You're still wearing your mask. No, the other one. Have a drink. Try not to think about all the tartan ribbons. Question other people's decisions. Try not to dwell on the tragedy. Become enraged at his misogyny. Distract, emotionally react, bake bread. Try and get out of your head. Experience the dread. Count down the minutes until you can finally go to bed, but you're still wearing your mask. No, the other one. <laughs> That's me clapping. Wow, thank you. Um, I f your, yeah, your spoken word is so powerful and um, there's so much to like to um, unpack and to, I like to, I've listened to it before and I like to listen a few times and really uh, get a sense and feeling for it. Um, I know that, can you speak about your experiences as, uh, or maybe even explain what a poet laureate is? Because I know you were for the former poet laureate of Halifax and yes. can you, um, you'd mentioned that, you know, like, you mentioned your roles at the beginning and that really it's the main like umbrella term you would use is helping. Mm -hmm. So one of my questions was like, as of the former Port Laureate of Halifax, like what did you feel were some of your responsibilities that you want to address or to, to help, so to speak? Yeah, um, so the Poet Laureate position is a two year term with the city where you are kind of recognized as the writer or the poet of the city um, and you have specific um, obligations of that role through performances and commissions but at the same time you also get to make that role into what it is that you want it to be. Now I was very lucky in that the poet laureate before me was L. Jones who is this incredible um, Black poet who really addresses a lot of issues within the um, criminal justice system and incarceration. And she turned that role very much into a, um, an activist role or an advocacy role. And I really, really admired that. And I wanted to keep that, um, that tone and that kind of momentum running with my my tenure as Poet Laureate. And so for me as a Mi'kmaq person and as an Indigenous woman, I didn't necessarily uh, see my my role growing up as somebody who would take on kind of these tough conversations or challenges. But when I was in that role, I felt a tremendous responsibility to my community and to other Indigenous people to speak up on things that I thought were inexcusable or who, that had languished far too long on in committees and discussion groups um, and email threads. And so within that role, I challenged the way in which we commemorate historical figures within um, Nova Scotia, particularly the Edward Cornwallis statue. So for those of you who don't know, Edward Cornwallis was the quote unquote founder of Halifax, and he issued a proclamation, a uh, scalping proclamation for the Mi'kmaq people because we were very good at um, defending ourselves. And it it created this very kind of strong polarizing within Halifax. A lot of folks, you know, accused us of trying to rewrite history. And we said, no, we just want all of history to be understood and to be known. Um, and we don't want to have to walk by somebody who is, you know, celebrated for murder and especially of our people. And so I challenged that, the, that kind of piece. That's kind of, I guess, the most notable one that I did within my tenure Poet Laureate. And we ended up getting the statue taken down. Um, they're going to have kind of like a municipality museum and they're going to have the statue in there along with all the context right because i think that's very important um, a statue doesn't teach it's, it's it's a thing of honor right and and so they're going to turn this into something that teaches and so that was kind of my role and it was this really nice to have this kind of city sanctioned 
um, role in which to run my mouth for lack of a better word. And uh, yeah, and I think the role is incredibly important. I think that artists get a lot done and they bring a lot of challenging material forward um, that maybe elected officials who perhaps have to um, appease their constituents, you know, for a potential re-election that I didn't necessarily have to do because I knew my role was two years. I was going to do what I was going to do and I was going to say what I was going to say and I didn't have to worry necessarily about trying to kind of get back into the role later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, know that, that that it's interesting that what you had said how you had never imagined that this was something that you might end up doing but this position you were you were chosen I'm imagining you were chosen for this position and then because you were in that position then you were able to take it like take advantage of it for for what what was obviously very important. You mentioned Cornwallis and I did, uh, you know, and that that speaks to a large, you know, a larger issue around the world with Canada, in Canada, the United States, certain definitely European uh, countries about statues. And um, that reminded me um, something that you had mentioned about, you know, the this, um, the city the officials are elected, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time um, in the way our democracy works is sometimes the city um, officials who are elected just really want to be re-elected again. So a lot, oftentimes, of course, they're going to try and, um, you know, speak to their constituents in, in different ways. I remember um, th that kind of makes me think of a, something that is like a broader question, but I think it might have applied to you. It's that I feel that uh, sometimes like because we know that exclusion has been part of like normal everyday common sense, uh, like exclusion of sort of different groups of people. So it's been, been like normal, normal common sense everyday thinking for a lot of people in Canada or in institutions in Canada. Like it's sort of rooted in this, in this, um, okay, let me rephrase what I'm trying to say. Exclusion has been sort of, uh, sort of the mainstay for many people in Canada, for many different groups in Canada, you know? And yet there you as the Port Laureate of Halifax, you were included in the conversation as you said, you know, and, that, and it was your job, you know? But I wanted to ask you, did you feel that um, because of your inclusion, like you, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like ruffled some feathers and that people weren't used to having, I mean, you had said before you had that, that person before you, uh, Ali J uh, Jones sort of had set the stage, but can, can you speak of whether there was like some discomfort as you yourself as a person moved through these different institutions, whether it be uh, this, like the city council, like the, those meetings or, even mainstream media, or I know you speak in schools. So I, that's kind of what I'm trying to ask you. Like the fact that now you, you've been included. Yeah. Was that, oh, I, I definitely made lots of people uncomfortable. Uh, and that's something that a lot of folks have, have said to me, like um, they'll come up to me after speaking engagement and say like, I felt really uncomfortable. Like I was made to think things very differently. And sometimes those, those feelings of discomfort spark a sense of like humility and a desire to want to do better. And sometimes those, you know, feelings of being uncomfortable can, you know, spark a really defensive position or even an offensive position. So in Halifax, there's a, uh, a tabloid kind of, you know, magazine that goes around and they had done this two page kind of poem response where they, you know, called me like a fair Indian maiden and a Micmac princess and said that I had used my wiles to like seduce the mayor into doing these things. And right. So like, that like that was probably the first and I had friends who would send me because like I don't I don't read these things I'm not subscribed to any of this stuff and so I would have friends or, or community members like from the Mi'kmaq communities would send me a message and saying oh my god you're you're in this and I was like oh okay and then I would look at it and you know if if I hadn't have made those people so uncomfortable or so angry or held up a mirror to them and they did not like what they see um, and instead of addressing what they did not like and see, you know, they, they wanted to break that mirror and make me feel harm. That's what they did. And so I feel like, like, for, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, you know, kind of looking at who is angry with you and depending on who is angry with you, then it seems like you're doing a good job, <laughs> you know? And um, yeah. And so like, that was something that I always you know, want it to do is to challenge, like within these roles is to challenge, but to challenge in a way where I can kind of like pull the rug out from underneath you with one hand and then use my other hand to help you up, right? Because for me, it's a responsibility. Like if all I do is make somebody feel horrendous, then what is the impetus for them to maybe want to be better? And 
that is a responsibility I personally have taken on. I do not think it is the responsibility of anybody who is coming from a marginalized position to take on that teaching role. Absolutely not. It is something that I have chosen to do individually. And so because I have, I happen to have the strength or the coping mechanisms or, you know, the desire to do so. And hopefully if I can help people maybe inspire them enough to take on their own learning, then they won't burden the marginalized to teach them about being marginalized. Does that make sense? Like yeah. it's, it's like empowering you to, to learn and to be better on your own and sure, come talk it out with me, but don't go to every native person or every black person or every person with an immigrant story or every, you know, like expecting and demanding knowledge. And then saying that if it's not, if you won't teach me, how will I learn? The whole point of it is to you take on this yourself mm -hmm. and learn, and I will help you be a sounding board when I have the capacity for it. Um, I've kind of lost track of what your question was. No, no, it's a really good question. <laughs> and you're, yeah, actually, it makes me think of something else. I know that you're obviously very, very good with words. Um, and also you, what you're telling me, what I'm hearing is that you decided it's very important to also use your voice, you know, mm -hmm. um, and to be heard. And actually, I wanted to go back a little bit to the Cornwallis um, situation because it was so... Um, I mean, it had been a long stand. It had been an issue for for decades, for centuries, in fact. But you know, for for decades. And I I remember um, reading that you said. So just if you can like paint the scene for us, if you will. But you're in this uh, meeting with city mm -hmm. elected officials, right? And I think what I remember you saying, sort of in an interview somewhere, was that they're not used to people like you being there. Yeah. People like you with who 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 have your point of view. That's what I mean by people like you who have your mm -hmm. point of view. Right. And also people like me, because there's never, but as far as I know, there's never been an indigenous person elected to council uh, in Halifax. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're an elected council member as well, right? So as the poet laureate? Is that no, I had to interview and I had to submit okay. an application. I had to go through a selection process in order to be uh, appointed. So oh, okay. yeah, cool. so it, it was a process. So I wasn't elected. It was like, please pick me. And here's why I think I deserve the role. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you did deserve it for sure. So I, um, I feel like you, there's that poem, of course, not perfect, like mm -hmm. I'm not perfect, you know, and it, in my opinion, it was very, it's like, it was very humanizing and people were very, that I feel like the poem, at least from my understanding over here in, in Montreal, had a huge impact on some of those elected uh, council members. Can you maybe speak to that or, and, and why the poem was called, uh, titled Not Perfect or? Yeah, absolutely. What I can do is I can pull it up if you'll bear with me. For sure. Because I just have like one giant PDF document, which is like the inside of my poetry book. So I have to go to the, yeah. <laughs> the table of contents to then find it. Yeah. Um, but I can explain a little bit too, just so because the statue, as you had said, has been taken down. And when Rebecca and others were fighting for that, it happened before everything happened in the United States this summer, when there was the movement mm -hmm. in the United States, where now uh, there have been more recognition and sort of recognizing the troubling nature of the historical past of these statues and to create context. But in Halifax, uh, the toppling of Cornwallis was a few years ago now already, wasn't it? Yeah, it came down in 2018, um, in January 2018, so about three years now. Um, and so what had happened was the year previous, it was a motion was put forward to have a discussion about how we or how Halifax kind of memorializes Edward Cornwallis. Right. So it wasn't a discussion to take down the statue or to change the names of streets and, and things, but rather it was just a motion to have a conversation, which felt so redundant to me. <laughs> um, and they it, it didn't pass. I think it, it failed. The motion failed. I think it was like eight to seven. It was only by like one or two. Um, but still, like eight people said, nope, we don't need to have this conversation. And at that time, there was the whole city council was white, um, mostly men, um, like significantly mostly men. Uh, and I remember there was one of the council members or one of the councillors essentially said in an interview, like through like the press briefing afterwards, says, well, you know, you know, if we look back and we kind of really look at his actions, you know, he, he, he wasn't a perfect man and blah, 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 and, you know. And I remember thinking like, well, there's, 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 there's different levels of not perfect, right? Like sometimes I, you know, put the trash outside my front door instead of going down the walk and putting it into the bin for, cause I'm procrastinating. Like that's a not perfect situation. Like 
issuing a state sponsored genocide on an entire nation of people like that's a different level of not perfect. And so I wrote that poem. And then it kind of like sat it sat like with me for a while and I kind of had it on my Facebook page at the time when I had Facebook. And then when it came to actually performing in council um, the following year, I had this other poem selected and I was working with the, his name's Jamie McClellan and he's the person who was like runs the Poet Larry Laurie program in Halifax. And I had this other poem selected and I'd send it to him because they needed to kind of do this other, you know, kind of like, I guess, prep the audience or something with it. And then right before we were going into city council, because it was a sitting city council, there's like a press gallery and then there was all the councillors and there's a podium in the middle where I was to speak. Uh, I turned to him and I said, I'm not doing that poem. I'm going to do a different one. <laughs> Just so you know, FYI. So you're not totally taken uh, off. You know, you're not caught off guard fully. I know I'm catching you off guard now, but you know, you have 35 seconds to prepare. And so I went in and I did not perfect. And I, most of the city council who I performed to, cause it was a new council. Um, was it? Yes, it was a new council at the time. They, uh, they, they were there. They were the ones who had made that decision, right? So I was kind of holding them accountable to their words. And I took the words from various quotes from them and I put it into the poem. And I, yeah, the humanizing of it is essentially saying like, okay, so we want to have the statue. You know what he did? This is the history. I'm going to lay out the history. Now, which one of you wants to explain this to my, to my nieces and nephews? Like when they go, who's that? Why do we have him up there? It, who wants to volunteer to explain to my nieces and nephew why we have a man who would have had their family scalped like up? Which one? Volunteers? Volunteers? No, you're going to just talk about the donair, which is like some drunk food. Like that's what you want to have a conversation about because that was a motion that passed in Halifax to make it the official meal of Halifax. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of turned their words back onto them. And I was like, I'm just playing back to you what it is that you said. And I guess it really affected and impacted a lot of them. And less than a year later, the statue was down. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's amazing, like you, again, I'm gonna go back to your, your being good with words. And it's so like, what you did is just say, this is what you've all said. So just listen to yourselves and if you, if you stand by that, then great. Like, but just as make sure you want to make sure that they heard uh, what they had been saying. So that yeah. poem really, really did it. Did so? Did you find it? Did you? Yes, I did. I have okay. it. Are you, are you gonna, would you mind? Do you want me to do it? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Oh, I think I mean it's. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water because my mouth gets dry when I perform. I apologize for the ASMR of me swallowing water to all the panelists. Or all the people tuned in, I should say. Okay, not perfect. I don't shower every day. I'm not perfect. I sing off key when I drive on the highway. I'm not perfect. I have a dedicated partner, but still get crushes every day. Hey, I'm not perfect. There are a lot of things I can forgive and understand as human in error, but not a single one of those comes in the form of inciting racialized terror. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but a lack of perfection is a poor excuse to keep Cornwallis enshrined regardless of his abuse. Please cut him loose. Do you get what I'm saying or is my argument obtuse? How can granting us our humanity be less of a priority than making the donaire the official food of this city? It's a pity that late night drunk foods get to be classified as today's most current issues. Where are our statues? May I suggest a few? Anime Aquash, Donald Marshall Jr. or Grand Chief Member 2. See, they all meet the criteria of not being perfect. They're a group of real apple tree serpents. Anime? A divorcee. Member two and Marshall, a rebel Catholic and a criminal. Maybe that last one ended in an acquittal, but it's because the world thought an ill news words were too brittle to be believed. And it's not news to me. We have already whitewashed our streets to rinse off our red stained hands and feet in that park. All paths leads to his, bron his bronze greed. I beg and plead. Can't you see what I see? That a man decreed a proclamation on our scalps. I'm taking you to task. I'm asking for your help to heal generations of spiritual welts because we were seen as animals only valued for our pelts. 
today. We are members of your community. Show us your humility. Take my extended branch in unity and stop honoring a man who prided himself on his limitless brutality, who counted Mi'kmaq fatalities. Our skins were used as currency. His legacy built on the belief that our vagrancy justified replacing our only home Mi'kmaq with a British colony, hell bent on extinguishing our existence. But we are persistent. Centuries later, we are still mounting a resistance because no amount of hubris can strip us of our resilience. We are still here. I can't make that any more clear. Don't fear a rewriting of the past, but rather how it looks when this decision is recorded in the history books, when you turned a blind eye and spied the easy way out, when you flexed your privilege clout and about with a predetermined outcome, because there is nobody in that room who looks differently than you to challenge the status quo, the same old, same old. Is this how Halifax chooses to be bold? Did you know that the West looked to the East on how to rid themselves of the indigenous beast? They looked to this coast to justify killing kids. They said all lice grows from nits. And if even only a fraction of this is true, is this the legacy you want immortalized in a statue? Do you want to be the one to explain this to my nieces and my nephews? It's time for your minds to be changed and pride to be checked. It's time that our voices are given a lot more respect. I will not fault you for a change of heart on the subject. Together, we can find a comp compromise and work it because at the end of the day, I recognize how hard it is to be perfect. Incredible. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have so many questions all at once. Um, how, okay, let me just go back. I th in that in that poem, and you've mentioned it now a few times, and I brought it up. The idea is what you said that people are you're challenging the status quo, you know. But what I want to highlight to uh, the people who are attending is, as they may not know, but in Halifax there is like a, a long, long-standing um, black community, the the British loyalists who've been there for for generations, uh, like we're a century, I think, if not more. And 400 years. Has, yeah, 400 how long years. the African Nova Scotians have been there. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that, but I always exaggerate. But so I didn't want to exaggerate. But yeah, over 400 years, my best friend is, is Scotian, as they say. Yeah. And the Mi'kmaq, as you know, people um, have, have been there, you know, native to the land. So I just wanted to just highlight that. I'm not asking you a question, but I just want to highlight that mm -hmm. the idea that you, you're marginalized and yet you are people, you, the, the status quo. You know what I mean? Like Halifax is, is full of people who aren't just white, say middle class, upper class men, and all voices uh, ought to be heard. You know, so it, it is really cool that th the fact that your your voice was finally allowed, and it was and it was heard. You know, people listen, and not just you. I know you're representing a, like a community, yeah. and you know, but yeah. So so thank you for that. I must have taken a lot of courage to change your mind at the the last minute. I, but yeah, like, yes and no, but it just felt like, like, this is my responsibility. Like I signed up for this role and these are the terms and agreements that I have committed to, like in my sense of integrity in the role. Mm -hmm. And so it, that helped, like, I wasn't trying to go viral. It wasn't my idea to make a living or a profit off of this. It was like, this is an issue that needs to be discussed. And what like very few Mi'kmaq people have access to a full seated city council in which to have this conversation. And so it was, yeah, it was just a responsibility and a duty of mine to do and I did it. And um, yes. I was really, yeah, I was nervous. I was very like sweaty. <laughs> like I was very, like, as soon as I finished, um, Jamie and a couple of other folks got up because I was going to be ushered out. Right. And I turned to him and I was like, let's get out of here. <laughs> like I need to get out. <laughs> but yeah, so it was nerve wracking, but at the same time, I had the strength of my convictions for lack of a better word. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's very inspiring. I, I show, I, anyhow, there's a student actually who has a poem, a uh, question. Yeah. Um, and I think it ties in right. It's a good time to bring it up. She asks, um, what got you, she said, hi, Rebecca, what got you into poetry? Um, it was uh, Elle Jones again. I, I just, I owe so much of my career to this incredible woman. Um, that it was a colleague of mine and we were talking about sometimes like the similar storylines that are between African Nova Scotians and Mi'kmaq people. So we had residential school, they had the home for colored children. Both of our communities have had like horrible industrial things put next to them, whether they be dumps or mills or plants or whatever, you know, continuously pushed to the margins, right? And she said, have you ever heard of Elle Jones or her work? Um, and I said, no, but I looked her up later on in the evening and 
um, I was just completely blown away by poetry done like that. Because for me and my high school and university experience, poetry was mostly put forward by like long dead white men. And I was like, I don't understand this, right? Or it would be metaphor that was so thick that it wasn't even accessible unless you had a specific cultural reference. And obviously old white dead men are not my cultural reference, right? Um, and so seeing Elle do that work, and she was incredibly encouraging for me when I was first stepping on stage. She was the person who signed me up for my first open mic. She encouraged me to try out for um, the poetry team that went to the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word. So it was Elle really who got me in, into this. Um, and so I encourage all of you folks to go look up Elle Jones, E-L, Jones and uh, see the incredible stuff that she does. Um, I it, it's inspiring. Cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and you're inspiring. That's a, that's what's great. It's like you, once one gets inspired, they can sometimes be inspiring to other people. Um, Cause it's, so yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I wanted to sort of just change the flow of the conversation a little bit from, mm -hmm. well, actually, maybe I could actually something I, I've heard that you wrote now children's books. Yeah. Your words in different ways. Can you speak to that for I can't, I actually, I think I have one on my shelf. If you can bear with me, I'll just go grab it and I can. Okay, just a second. <laughs> All right, so. Um, have you written more than one? Sorry, I don't know if- Yeah, I have two children's books. Um, I, so one is like a, a regular kid's book. It's not written in rhyming prose or anything like that. And it's just kind of tells the story of Swift Fox, which is the name my dad calls me. Um, and it's about like Swift Fox's first time going to the reserve. And so it's just like this really kind of cool, really beautiful book that talks about kind of like learning about a culture for the very first time that's like not yours. And so obviously Swift Fox is having a bit of a hard time with it because you know, everything's new and she feels like she doesn't fit in and she's really nervous about, you know, learning who she is. And it's the whole idea about how Swift Fox is like learning to be Mi'kmaq, right? But her father keeps telling her it's in her all along. And that kind of story arc of like, if it's in me, why can't I find it sort of thing. Um, and that, that one means a lot to me, like that, that particular story, because it's basically based off of my story, right? Of trying to figure out who I am and it's based off of my first time going to reserve as well as like my whole life condensed into like a short children's book story arc. And then the other book, I actually have its companion book here, which is, um, so this is I Lost My Talk by Rita Jo. I Lost My Talk is an iconic poem that she wrote about her experiences in residential school. It has been in curriculum, it has won awards, it has been turned into like a national music project. And so, and now it's been turned into a children's book. And so I wrote the companion piece called I'm Finding My Talk that goes along with this poem. So um, I Lost My Talk was about Rita's experience in residential school and I'm Finding My Talk is, a, is like a rhyming prose children's story about the generation afterwards of indigenous kids who are finding their talk and who they are and their language and their culture and their community belonging. And this one was incredibly special to me because Rita Jo was a Mi'kmaq poet. Um, she was incredible. She wrote about in a very vulnerable first person stance about her experiences in residential school and about loss and about figuring out who she was and, and culture and like that reclamation piece of relearning her language. And that really hadn't been done before, right? In such as this beautiful way. And I, I loved her work long before I ever was asked to write this kind of co, co piece or response piece. Um, and just being completely overwhelmed and blown away in the, <clears throat> in the most positive way possible that um, to write that piece. And then when I found out her family really liked the piece and said that Rita would be so excited um, that it was very emotional for me uh, to kind of read those words and to talk to her daughter and uh, yeah. And just about kind of creating children's content. So kids like me can see themselves in books and children who are not like me can be really critical and ask good questions. Because I remember when I would read these books to kids. So when we could go to classrooms um, and I would read them in classrooms with children, children had such good stories about, or good questions about like, well, why did, why did 
she have to cut off all of her hair and how come she couldn't see her mom and dad and so it helps educate young kids about you know our histories and our stories in a very vulnerable um, and like emotional way mm -hmm. so that because the, the older you get the harder it is to unlearn what you've always thought to be true and so here it is that this like these young kids are asking these incredible questions um, and learning our story from a very young age yeah definitely and we're in a very good moment right now it's there's obviously so much more that needs to be done but the moment um sorry if did, did you say your book is called finding my talk i'm finding my talk yeah. Finding my talk yeah and uh this moment is a is a good time for that you know and and the able the, the ability that the fact that people want to um know and want to hear and want to listen not just kids but but the children's books are amazing so i this is just a side question but so when did you do the first one i'm just curious it's just the first book like what Oh, uh, I lost my talk. Uh, that was published in 2019. The, and then, the, yeah, sorry, the first and one. then, yeah, it was published in 2019. Oh, okay. And then my other two books came out um, within a month of each other in 2020. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's I just, again, I'm going to keep going back to that, but you, you really do use your words and in, in many ways to uh, help and inspire like many different gen generations of people in many different walks of life. So it's pretty much it's pretty cool um i wanted to ask you like i wanted sort of to now switch it up a bit um i was in it as you know uh, based i think mostly based on the truth and Re uh, reconciliation commission a lot of institutions like vanier do land acknowledgements mm -hmm. and, um there's been a lot of talk um about how like i'll just give you an example of two kind of polarizing views and some people might say oh it's useless the audience doesn't even listen anymore it's like me to asking people to turn off their cell phones it just becomes background noise and uh and yet other people also would say no it's important but it doesn't go far enough you know so i'm just wondering if you have an opinion or want to speak to that um, yeah um in my like we do a land acknowledgement before our kind of like weekly student services meeting and it's a part of the practice and each uh, of my colleagues takes their turns doing it and they're always very awkward and unsure about it they stumble over words and for me we had this big conversation around it because i asked um, are all you folks afraid to do land acknowledgements because I'm the one in the meeting? Like, um, is it about me? And we had this really open and honest conversation around it. And so for me, when it comes to land acknowledgements, there's a little bit of definitely lip service that's being paid because a land acknowledgement is the equivalent of somebody saying something like, um, well, I acknowledge I stole your car. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to give it back but I take full responsibility for stealing your car. Just so you know, so that you know, and that I know that I stole it. Um, maybe I'll give you a ride from time to time, but you can't ask for too much because it's now my car. And so there's like that kind of like a mentality around it. I think what land acknowledgements needs to do is they need to be held one with like the same reverence that we hold a minute of silence or poppies, right? That every 10 year old kids should hear a land acknowledgement and be able to explain to you why we do them. Well, we do a land acknowledgement because um, indigenous people were killed or displaced so that I can enjoy the lifestyle that I have. And that is something that we need to remember, right? That needs to be given that same reverence for anyone who has died willingly or unwillingly for this country to come to be. Um, and so I think that's the part of land acknowledgements that make me sad is when they get grouped in with housekeeping, right? We're going to acknowledge the land. I'm going to tell you the washrooms are over there, you know, that sort of thing. So there needs to be a little bit, I think, more ceremony around them. And uh, I think we need to get away from scripts. Mm -hmm. Every institution has a script and that it's, I'd rather somebody stumble and really kind of think about the words that they're thinking that they're saying in that moment and try to kind of make that connection to the audience than rum, you know, ramble off like a perfectly written script, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's about the process. It's supposed to start a conversation and to like look at being better as an institution, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a land acknowledgement, but you don't change a single thing, get rid of that land acknowledgement because there's no point in doing it. It's like, it's, it's, it's insulting at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But if you do a land acknowledgement as a way to continuously remind yourself to be better and to change and dismantle a system, then that's a great use of practice. If it's part of your, yeah, if it's a part of your process to look at and address institutional change. Mm -hmm. So I would rather 
an organization not do one at all if they have no intentions of changing um, in meaningful ways. And if you are an organization that is really trying and you're doing it and you're doing it awkwardly, but with a ton of humility, then, then have at her. So I think it's the context that really matters. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, in our in our script, at Vanier, uh, it says that uh, we are on unceded territory. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what that means to people who would have no idea? Yeah, it was never given up. Yeah. <laughs> it was taken. Um, so in Mi'kma'ki, my territory, which is the Gaspé, it is New Brunswick, it is PEI, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and like a little bit of Maine and down the eastern seaboard. That's Mi'kmaq territory and it's all unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Um, and basically that means when we signed peace and friendship treaties, so the covenant chain of treaties, I think it's from like 1721 to 1752 and further beyond. Like we said, we signed multiple treaties and none of it was about land secession. It was all about sharing the land. It was about respecting one another's positions on the land. Um, and it was about working together. And that does, none of that is saying, yeah, we no longer want this, it's yours. And so that unseated is incredibly important. And I know that there are lots of organizations, um, the Nova Scotia government, other, you know, probably the federal government as well that don't want to put in seat unseated in there because I think they think it's some form of culpability or makes them look bad but that is the case it's unseated you didn't steal it personally but many folks benefit from it being stolen whether it be systemically or you know the fact that you were able to go buy a home or the fact that you drive on roads like whatever that may be my people and many other indigenous people were displaced for that quality of life um, in that position in life. And so I think it's important that we really sit with that. It sh if you're uncomfortable, you should be. <laughs> and so what are you going to do with that uncomfortableness? I hope it's going to spur you to, to want to be better and to learn forward, to mm -hmm. move forward, I should say. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. Um, you use the word systemic, and um, that's a word that now has been part of um, more people's vocabulary since the summer, especially, um, unfortunately, because it, of really horrible things that have been happening in the States and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But in Canada now, so when I, let's just say, like I teach a, class, a course called Race and Racism, and one of my main goals is to talk about systemic racism and structural racism. Mm -hmm. and last fall, it was actually, uh, um, I, I, I don't want to say easier, but people had actually heard the word, whereas like previous, before, most people had never even heard of the word systemic, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, in your opinion, why do you, and I'm thinking about the land that you just talked about, why do you think systemic racism still persists and thrives uh, in Canada, in every single city and province in Canada? Yeah, because systems are built to kind of like move along. It doesn't matter who's driving it or who's at the helm or who is in that system. Those systems were designed to be racist and exclusionary. So you could have the the most anti-racist people in a system, but if that system isn't addressed, then it will continue to move along. And so examples of that would be things like the Indian Act and the, the Department of Indigenous and Northern Affairs. Like we have, like that is a part of the system and that, you know, Carolyn Bennett may be a lovely person, I don't know, but she is the head of a system that use, uses legislation to decide who gets to be indigenous in Canada. And with that, who has access to rights, supports, healthcare, education, like that is a system that is racist. I often make it a little bit more tangible and I say we have a system in our economic system that punishes the poor because if you are poor or you have bad credit you have to pay higher interest you are right so we, we punish you for not having money by charging you even more money to keep you poor or to keep a system or a person impoverished and that is a system that is going about its own thing it does not matter who is working in those banks they could be the most wonderful people in the world right um, who come from labor union families. But if you have a system that says, looks at how much money you have, and if you don't have much, they're gonna go, well, we're gonna charge you more money to access loans. So it's a system that kind of runs itself. Um, 
we have that like redlining in the United States for mortgages for black families and black neighborhoods, right? And all of the system that goes into that. Now that's illegal now, but those are still practices that still come out, right? So the system runs itself and people just happen to fill spaces in it. And so you need to break those systems if you want to be able to see meaningful change. And I understand that that is very uncomfortable. And that means that you might see a drop in productivity or a job loss or a, a change, whatever it's gonna be. Um, but you need to break those systems because they're just gonna keep running, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and systems always change because systems are built by humans and human beings and their cultures change all the time. Nothing is nothing is static, even if it's been going on for centuries, right? So it's it definitely always changes. And that makes me think of um, the system like Canada was built on that system of racism, right? So we, we know, uh, at least we understand that it was built on, as you just mentioned, like taking people off their land, you know, but I just would like you to highlight for everybody when we're talking, maybe I'll, I'll start, but when you're talking about land, we're, we're talking, you were talking about roads, but we're talking about resources, right? At the end of the day. And that's where I think, um, so I want to make that link. We're talking about the economy. We're talking yeah. about, you know, and so that's why it's so huge that, like, as you were saying, the yeah. government doesn't want to recognize it. Yeah. So Canada is extremely wealthy. We are an extremely wealthy first world country because of the resources that we have. We have potash, we have oil, we have, I think, diamonds up north, we have gold, we have forestry, we have fishery, we have so many resources, we're in an enormous landmass. And that is why we are so wealthy. And if you recognize indigenous rights to the land, if you say, all right, we messed up, uh, we're going to recognize this, you have a say over what happens to your land, all of a sudden, Canada's resource based economy is extremely threatened. And so when it comes to recognizing indigenous rights, because we are so tied to the land and thus the Canadian economy, our, I feel very much so that we aren't necessarily going to be taking it, taken as seriously because it means a disruption to that economy. Um, and and that, that is a big scary thing for lots of people. Um, it's, and it's a big scary thing for me too. Like I'm a part of, like I live in this system. I have a house that I have a mortgage that I have to pay for. So I go to work, <laughs> you know, like, so, and so like, I don't know what that looks like, what the answers to it, but I recognize that the system, like we are wealthy because of those sorts of things. And I get, it makes me so, so mad, so mad that more often than not, you have these people coming from backgrounds of oppression or marginalizations that then get pitted against one another um, in order to get airtime, right? Um, to get empathy, to get public sway, to get support. So you have people who are living in communities that have been devastated by the boom bust community. So lots of people are living below the poverty line. All of a sudden oil production is going to go there and the, great, a new job, bunch of jobs I can now support and feed my family. But then it's coming at the expense of indigenous rights to land and climate change and all those sorts of things. And so we're constantly pitted against one another. Something that's happening here in Halifax is that they're going to do this um, really big boardwalk across Peggy's Cove, which is like this kind of big touristy area to make it more accessible for people who have mobility concerns, but they're kind of being infringed upon our sweetgrass harvesting areas. So once again, you're pitting again, people who live with disability up against indigenous people's sacred pieces and we're fighting each other. And that's what's so frustrating because it shouldn't be an either or right? It should be universal design. It should be like barrier free. And how do we address that? And I don't, I don't know that answer, but I'm really tired of being pitted against other marginalized people for airtime to the powers that be, you know, and that's where my, I'll get off my soapbox, but man, does that really grind my gears? Well, no, I hear you. And that's part of the system. The system was built on that through colonialism, divide and conquer, right? So mm -hmm. they just keep using that same, um, that same tactic because unfortunately it works you know in a power driven system where it's a zero sum game as you were saying but it doesn't have to be that way right at all um okay so i wanted to sort of i i have a student um who's familiar with your work because she's taken a few of my classes so <laughs> and um i asked her uh, just in passing i said if you if you could ask rebecca a question i mean maybe she's here today i'm not sure and there's other people who want to ask you a question but i asked her if you could ask rebecca a question what would you ask her and she said if a magic fairy gave you one wish, a magic fairy gave you one wish, what would it be? Hmm. It's a very, very, and it's probably like the same, like, ex-nay on wishing for more wishes. It, well, 
I mean, no, there's no rules. <laughs> well, first of all, I would wish for more wishes. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I think that kind of undermines the, 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 the question, right? I think if I had a magic fairy in one wish, I think I would wish for every individual to have a very strong sense of humility. Because I think more often than not, people don't have it and they can't see what they're wrong. They're unwilling to see it. They're just, it's, it, it's just, it creates this scenario where it's like, I don't know how to articulate it beyond that, where like I find myself in positions where I'm having a conversation that's making me uncomfortable or I'll get called out for something and I get immediately defensive and it just makes everything so much worse. And then you just refuse, you just dig your heels in and you refuse to change anything about you. Right. And I think that if I could give our leaders a sense of humility to admit that they messed up instead of doubling down and to, and, and, and with that strong sense of humility comes everything that would stem from it, like wanting to then make meaningful change and support. And how would we make sure that this never happens again? I think that would be it. A really strong sense of humility. Have, that you, would... have you written a poem about that? N no, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but I probably maybe could. In the future, maybe, you never know, you never know. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I do see, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. I see a bunch of questions. I don't know. Am I supposed to answer these questions? No, not yet. Don't okay. worry. Okay. Look, yeah. But I'm going to ask you one more question and then, um, and then we're going to, we'll look through them and we can and figure that out. Okay. We still, we still have uh, time. So the, the, the last question was um, the Humanities Symposium Committee. They actually picked a common question for all of um, the people that are being interviewed this week. Um, and it, it basically works with the theme of reconnections. So the theme for this uh, Humanities Symposium was reconnections. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, have you changed your thinking about anything since your last time at Vanier? You came and gave a great talk in 2017. It was called mm. 1490 Who. So yeah. yeah, that was, yeah. I think that I have definitely softened my edges when it comes to, mm, I'm trying to think of a, a less intense word than retribution. <laughs> Um, I think for a very long time, just because like, because I had been harmed growing up and like, I was so angry and I didn't have a direction for my anger. So it kind of exploded all over the place. And then as I started to learn more, um, and I wanted to see change, my anger definitely softened and found a better direction. Um, and so I think consequence is really important but I disagree on extreme punishment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I think people should be held accountable for the things that they say and they do and they promise and then break. Um, but I, there needs to be a place for them to be, to be better people. If all we do is punish and don't help rehabilitate, help support, and I'm not saying like victims or whatever have to take part in that, but rather like a social fabric, what is going to be the impetus to change, right? Because um, I think back to like teachings that I get from my elders and my community members. And I, I had a really challenging phone call with somebody who found, just found my number and wanted to tell me their thoughts and opinions about things. And I was on the phone with them for 45 minutes. And, and like, it's not, retribution and punishment and like humiliation and like all those sorts of things like that's not our way because like excluding some from buddies from society and our communities was a death sentence right you needed your community to be better and to get better and to to support one another and so I think that might be where I have softened a little bit because I definitely, when I was younger, it's like well this horrible stuff happened to me and you need to know what it feels like to feel this bad and I don't, I don't want people to know what it was like to feel this bad because it sucks. I want you to understand the impact of what feeling this bad can do to an individual. And I want you to really sit with that and understand it. And then I want a, a person, a system, a society to change. I think that would be where I have shifted a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and it makes sense because that's how you started off sort of this conversation by saying you want to pull the rug out, right? But then also then help them up with the other and, and with the other hand and you're taking on that responsibility. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard from others as well that as, as, we, as they get older, they tend to soften up on certain things, but not you take the edge off, but in a different way. Like, so it's not, it's not, it's the same issue, but it, anyways, I don't want to, but yeah, I, I, sorry, I understand what you're saying. So yeah. It's like, yeah, so it's like, it's not, yeah, it's just learning and, 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 and realizing certain things and, and, and still the end result is would, would ideally be the same, but just getting there is completely different. And I like to, especially what you said about how that's not how your community does things and that you, you know, we always rely on community. And I think that if anyone doesn't understand that concept that we're, we're human beings and we're social beings and we need each other, especially during this global pandemic, I think people realize that more and more and more that we all depend on communities and we depend on each other. And yeah, and that can also create great solutions for moving forward, you know? Well, we have this like, like very much so in the United States, but Canada as well has this like rugged sense of individualism that is so detrimental. Like my sister lives in the United States and she was talking about how if she were allowed to work remotely forever, she would come back to Canada. She said that uh, in the US, what is considered like left or more progressive is Canadian conservative. Cause she said, even conservatives in Canada believe in socialized medicine. <laughs> like there is this, like, I will happily pay however much of my, you know, paycheck in taxes to ensure that somebody down the road doesn't have to sell their house because their kid got cancer. Like that is an easy offsetting cost for me, right? I pay taxes to have a good school zone, even though I don't have kids, you know, like that is, that is an easy payment for me. And I think that this notion of like this rugged me, 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 my money, my problems, you should have thought of that beforehand. Nobody thinks about that. Nobody thinks about like those horrible life altering things. So we need as a community to be prepared for it so that we don't leave anybody out in the cold. Now, that doesn't mean if you hurt me, you don't have to talk, we don't have to talk it out. You don't have to address it. You don't have to try to create some sort of um, like recompense. Like how do we, how do I make up for what it is that I have done? I think that there's, but it doesn't need to be punishment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. No, I definitely yeah. know exactly what you mean. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's look at some of these answers. I'm gonna, um, I think uh, I'll just, Go to the first one um with okay sorry um okay so the one i'm reading is hi rebecca what are your main goals when you uh took on this role as port laureate what were you trying to change or teach people with your role i think we, we might have addressed that but yeah and like i didn't really have any goals at that point in time it was more of a like oh i, I got the role interesting like i didn't expect to get the role so then but then when i was in it it was like gonna bring forward some tough conversations okay yeah. Cool. So I have to just, I'm just trying to look at these now. Yeah. So moving forward and help you. Okay. So here's another question from um, an attendee. So what is the way to move forward and help besides being educated? We're always told to affect change, but I don't know how. Yeah. I think part of it is like addressing like the inner works, right? So it's not just about like knowing facts, but it's like, if I have said anything to anonymous attendee with their question that has made you feel uncomfortable or defensive or your back gets up, maybe take a minute to investigate that feeling, right? Like, why are you getting mad? <laughs> you know, um, take time to think about that. And I would also say about like talking to your own folks, like if you're a white person, talk to other white people about this conversation. So you may say like, well, I've never done or said a racist thing in my life. Congratulations. I'm not going to give you a gold star, but have you heard it and then never said anything? And I think so much of us fear like conflict and not fear, like, cause I've, a lot of people are like, oh, it's a safety thing. And I was like, I don't necessarily know if that's the case. I think it's an awkward thing. I think nobody wants to be the, the Debbie Downer or the party pooper who everyone's having a good time. And it says some, somebody says something like, blah, 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 that guy's off the reservation. Nobody wants to shut down that conversation and say, hey, listen, that's not cool. I'm, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to rephrase that, right? And so I think it's that fear of awkwardness that stops people from doing that because that would go a real long way that if I didn't have to continuously defend myself because I got other people who are backing me up, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be part of it is to investigate those uncomfortable feelings in yourself. Why are you feeling that way? Where did you learn your teachings from? Where did you build your foundation with what truths, truths, right? Um, and then to, to 
own the awkwardness. And if you, I, I do this all the time because my job is to have very uncomfortable conversations. It's not easy or fun for me always, but for me, it's like going into this conversation, I am expecting it to be awkward so that when it is awkward, I'm not caught off guard. I knew it was coming and I power through. Or if it's not awkward, that's excellent. I set the bar very low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know exactly. Uh, yeah, and it's important that you keep repeating the idea about being uncomfortable is not a bad thing, actually. No. We, we're allowed, we should be able to sit in it because often as in, in, in mainstream culture in Canada, we're taught not to ever feel uncomfortable. So we want to move away from it right away. And sometimes people want to move away from it by being like, okay, how can I help? Like, or, you know, but they just want to jump in different directions as, but it's okay. Like, so I'm just reiterating, like, it's okay to sometimes just be uncomfortable. Yeah. Feel that and, and then wonder why and then and go, go from there, you know? So yeah. Safe space is not safe from discomfort. I think that should be a new mantra because like, this is a safe space. We can have a conversation safe for who, right? Yeah. Because if I have, I don't know, some guys like this is a safe space. And then they say something that's really like outlandish or like, it's just like rhetoric, you know, like that's very uncomfortable for me, you know, and like, I'm going to challenge you on it. And then you're going to get upset because I'm challenging and it's still a safe space. Nobody's getting punched in the face, but we're having a challenging conversation. And that's what safe space means. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So there's a student who said, um, hi, Rebecca Thomas, you mentioned residential schools earlier. I'd like to know what exactly these were and why they aren't mentioned or really mentioned or taught in our Canadian history classes. Oh man, I'm going to blow your mind and not in a good way. I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so for 150 years in Canada, it was uh, mandatory that Indigenous parents send their children to these schools called residential schools. And they were kind of these industrial schools where kids, it was under the guise that they were going to get an education, but rarely that was the case. They may have gotten an hour or two of schooling, um, you know, learning their ABCs and a little bit of math, whatever that may be. But for the most part, they were run by um, religious organizations and then taken over by the state of Canada um, to uh, civilize or integrate or assimilate indigenous kids into the body politic. So what they did is they made languages illegal. They were often very violent places. Um, there, if you go and you look up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, you'll find all sorts of resources there. But uh, my dad went to one, uh, a residential school here in, in uh, Nova Scotia. And yeah, they, they were really horrendous places. And it was, you had to send your kids there. And they, they did it in a way where, you know, Indigenous people were confined to reserve. We had these things called the pass system where you couldn't leave without permission, all these sorts of things. Our supports, our rations, uh, you know, to, you know, support monies, whatever it was tied to sending your kids to these schools. So if you didn't send your schools, you got cut off. So, and then they made it illegal for indigenous kids to attend public school. So if you wanted your kid to get any semblance of an education, no matter how horrendous it was, you were forced to send your kids to residential school. It was just a whole hot mess. It was awful, awful, awful. And the last one closed in 1996 uh, in Saskatchewan. I was born in 1986, uh, if it gives you kind of some context there. So uh, I suggest you Google Canadian residential school system and your mind will be blown in a very terrible, terrible way. Um, so we are still experiencing the massive um, echo of the effect of those schools on the generations afterwards, um, me being one of those kids. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry if you mentioned this. Um, did you address why the Canadian history classes don't talk about it? Yeah, Canada's like deeply shamed. Uh, I think like if you think on a, on a uh, national scale or international scale, or Canada is seen as this very like welcoming, this kind of utopia of diversity and we're so friendly and we're so nice. Um, and, you know, teaching about these things, Canada has a very, very, very dark history with its Indigenous people. Um, and not just Indigenous people, you know, we had slavery here in Canada, um, you know, looking at how the railway was built, right, uh, across the country is also really horrendous. We had the Chinese head tax, we were really not an inclusive society at all. Um, and, you know, governments make curriculum and governments in power don't want to talk about what governments do, you know, and so it's, it's a tragedy. And so, so much of what I do is just bring this stuff to light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good answer. Uh, that question, what's, in, what's great, um, at least since the Truth and um, Reconciliation Commission has like been um, sort of, you know, 
one of them is to educate within the educate like the school system and mm -hmm. i've been teaching for a while now but when i first started talking about residential schools the vast majority of the class had never heard of it and now the vast majority of the class has have yeah heard of it. so that's a big you know big leap within say 10 years I, think. I didn't know about them and my dad went to one yeah well there you go yeah exactly right? yeah. and sometimes the students would ask me uh how come they'd be shocked at 17 18 year olds that they had never heard of this before right mm -hmm. like so they were just like how then that then they start thinking and realizing certain things like it's what you just said yeah i think we have time for one last question and this is i think a sure. good good question to end um hello rebecca what is a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self and or young people today so these are 18 19 year olds 17 year olds um the advice that i'd give to my younger self is it's <laughs> I think it's unique to me as a kid who, well, I shouldn't say unique to me, but maybe perhaps it's unique to kids who grew up being neglected or abused the way that I grew up is that um, approval isn't always a good thing to seek and it's not always going to be good for you, right? Um, because for me, approval meant I was worth something. So I was a value because uh, I didn't see my value. I had to get it from other people because it certainly wasn't something that was given to me growing up a lot. Um, I got my grandfather was my saving grace. Uh, he but he died when I was a teenager. So I would say that it's not approval is not as, as grand as you think it is. Um, and that it's okay to to piss people off if you need to, if you're trying to like protect yourself or whatever that may be. But yeah, so desperate for approval, so desperate for um, attention, love, safety, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, approval is not the way to get that. I guess that, uh, yeah, don't be so desperate for approval. It's, it's not important. That's cool. That's really good advice for any, anyone of any age, actually. So, yeah. 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 I, I think about back, like I, I do think about things where it's like, I worked myself so hard or I was, I did something that like ethically and morally, it didn't feel well with me or that I was afraid of getting into an argument and that someone would hate me, you know, and I, and I, and I, I cringe when I think of those moments of like a younger Rebecca. And I'm still learning. That's something that takes a lot of effort to to work through. And it's something that's probably going to be with me for the rest of my life, but it's becoming easier to to push back against that need within me to to find approval, to find and seek approval. Yeah, definitely. And I like that you said it's a work in progress because all of these things are right when it's so deep rooted. Um, you know what we have about five minutes and then we get actually kicked off a webinar okay i don't know if you have like a another uh, like poetry that you have read readily that you would be able to read i don't know if it's like putting you on the spot too much or no i can do that i'm trying to think of like what are some like like fun fun ones <laughs> i'm so dis so dis yeah i actually do have a fun one i like it i wrote it recently it's called fuck buns <laughs> Okay, and it's about being multifaceted. So I think it goes really well with what I just spoke with. So this is what I'll finish with. Okay. okay. Opening the fridge door, I spy what I'm looking for, the 99 cent pack of hot dogs and Heinz ketchup that was always a staple in a house that was constantly running out of milk. The mustard could be no name, French's or some other off brand, it didn't matter. It was all about the ketchup. When times were dire, you still had to know how to treat yourself, but the mustard had to be neon yellow with enough vinegar to polish silver. There are those who boil hot dogs or fry them in a pan, but in this under-supervised and overstretched house, it was a one, two, three on the microwave on thrift store dishes, assuming they were clean dishes. Otherwise, those bad boys went on nothing. The results were the same. We didn't fuck with buns, a couple of slices of Wonder Bread, except it wasn't Wonder Bread. It was grocery store version that would disappear in a day, fold it in half around cheese whiz, peanut butter, or in this case, hot dogs. Like I said, we didn't fuck with buns. We had to have more than a single talent. We had to be multifaceted in our skill set if we were to ever make it out of that house. We had to rise and grind, be toast for breakfast, a little burnt, but you just had to scrape that off. There were no do-overs. Nothing went to waste. We had to carry it all and be thick-skinned enough for a sandwich at lunch holding in the too much that was put on us. We had to be grilled cheese for dinner dipped in Campbell's tomato soup, except it wasn't Campbell's. It was no name, but it got the job done without all, without all the compliments. We carried around our food on paper towels since the dishes weren't clean, except it wasn't paper towel. It was a couple of pieces of toilet paper stashed on top of the fridge next to the scotch tape in case we needed tissues or a band-aid. We sat in front of the TV eating dinner. We sat in front of the TV eating our supper, watching sitcoms like Family Matters, Full House, and Boy Meets World with their name brand things, clean dishes, and parents. We wondered what it was like to live in a fairy tale. I still prefer microwave hot dogs on bread. I don't buy buns because I know better. 
Nice. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. And, uh, sorry, your poetry, your spoken word leaves me speechless. I don't know. <laughs> That's but, okay. But, yeah. Somebody said write a poem about hot dogs and I was like, done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to say on behalf of everybody in the Venue community, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, be here for this interview. Um, it's, you know, it, it means it's just, it's always nice to hear your, your point of view To I, I personally feel you, you're very inspiring and I know that, um, I'll just repeat what you said once or what I read once, you said, you know, you're good with words and I feel that you've really then taken that and um, use that as you said because you want to help people and i think that's really really awesome that something that you were good at you're able to use to help and um all different types of people thank and, you yeah and i want to just say one last thing too you really helped my class um we talk about really tough things and then i i'll put on some of your you know spoken uh, word poetry and then they're like it, it, it resonates with them in a different way and oh good and, yeah and uh so yeah so thank you very much for coming and um thank you for having me and good luck with that hurricane tomorrow stay yeah. safe Thank like you. yeah we'll see how it goes <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right take care now you too bye bye